America's greatest generation, the soldiers, sailors, Marines, and Airmen who served their country so well during the World War II years of 1941 through 1945 and beyond. We recognize the sacrifices and dangers they endured. However, we don't always remember the women, the women who served their country side by side with the men of the armed forces. They too are part of America's greatest generation. Hello, my name is Mike Guppel and welcome to another in the Pace TV series, Unsung Heroes. My guest today is Peg Trout. Peg is the author of the book, Sisters in War. Peg, welcome to Pace TV and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Now, <clears throat> tell us about your book, Sisters in War. Sisters in War is a collection of World War II women veterans' stories as well as their photographs. And in the photographs, they're holding something that they had during their war era years, which I wanted them to connect the past with the present. Mm -hmm. It's Navy, Army, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and also officer as well as enlisted. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure many people realize in those days that we had women serving in all branches of the military. It came about a step at a time. Mm -hmm. Army was first, then Navy, then I believe it was uh, Marines, and then Coast Guard last. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And approximately, you may not have all this information uh, at your fingertips, but how many women do you, would you say in the thousands served? Over, uh, over 400,000. 400,000, that's close to a half a million. Correct. Wow, Correct. That, that's interesting. So <clears throat> what inspired you to get involved in a, in a project like this? It happened by accident. Uh, in 2002, I became very interested in photography. And I uh, enrolled in a two-year professional f uh, certificate at UCSD um, for photography. And one of the first assignments was family portraits. Well, all of my huge family lives back in northwestern Ohio, and I didn't have any out here. So I asked my instructor if I could center my project around my great aunt's army picture. And he said yes. The first thing that I did was I went to the veterans home in Chula Vista here in San Diego, and I interviewed and photographed nine World War II women veterans there to add to my aunt's story and photograph. Um, I received an A in the class, and I put it away. Um, two years later, I pulled it out to show to another instructor, and she said, my gosh, you can't stop here. You have to continue collecting and try to get this published. There's a book here, right? There's a book here. <laughs> And with just those few words from a teacher, that was the spark that began it all. Um, so that, that was how it all got started. How long ago was that? It's actually, those first 10 interviews were in 2002. Mm -hmm. Then, seriously, from 2004 on. And you, you published when? July of 2008. So that was a four-year endeavor, really? Four years, yes. Wow, interesting. Now, tell us a little bit about, a little bit about your Aunt Flo because she must have been a remarkable woman to have started all of this. <laughs> she was a remarkable <coughs> woman. She was before her time. Um, she, when President Roosevelt signed the bill that women could go into the Army, that was the first step, uh, she was 37 years old and had a, a beauty shop in our small hometown back in Ohio. When the President signed the bill, she closed the doors to her beauty shop she walked away from it. She went to Dayton, Ohio, and enlisted. Right. And she was one of the very first ones to go. So there weren't that many women who left their home or their business or their jobs at that time to go into the military. Correct. It was an unknown. Yeah. Um, they were stepping into a place that had not been created for them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and women were still in the, in the homes being homemakers, mm -hmm. not so much out in uh, the work world. And what year was this again? This would have been 1942 42. when he signed the bill. She served from 43 to 45. Uh, so the, uh, the Pearl Harbor was in December of 41, so that really was the beginning of the war, 1942. Yes. Absolutely. Hmm. So how did the, writing the book impact your life? Well, I've always been a history buff. That was my minor in college. So I knew I was going to learn a lot, but I think what struck me the most was their humbleness in telling their stories. Oftentimes they would say, well, I really didn't do that much. And then they would begin telling me their stories. 
I, I was struck by their humbleness, by their strength, by their courage. Um, as I said, they were stepping into something that had not been built for them, and they had to prove themselves over and over and over again. I can imagine the challenges they had to face. Very much so. Yeah. Uh, 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 big ones. They were fighting the Japanese, the Germans, and sexual s discrimination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's unfortunate. It, it still exists today uh, to some degree. So uh, aside from nursing and other obvious skills that women performed in the military, what are some of the other jobs that w women had in the military? In the beginning, um, they were mostly doing clerical jobs. Uh, but when the war became too fronted and they needed more men on the front and on the ships, the jobs opened up and women became parachute riggers. Uh, they worked in electronics, aircraft uh, mechanics, motor pool, um, intelligence analyst. Um, it went on and on and on. And as the war went on, the more jobs opened up. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand there were some women pilots as well that flew aircraft. Yes, they, they worked for the Army. They weren't a part of the Army at the time. They were called WASP, Women Air Force Service Pilots. Mm -hmm. And they transported the planes from the point of a factory to embarkation. Uh, they flew test flights. They taught young pilots, mm -hmm. uh, pulled targets mm -hmm. for uh, the uh, air, uh, air artillery to shoot at from down below. They did a lot of different That had to be challenging for a woman to fly an airplane with a target towed behind her and have people firing machine guns and cannons. To and, and oftentimes they didn't hit the right target. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure of that. that. That's quite a, a, an array of, of tasks. I know uh, you and I are both veterans. Right. Um, and the initial training, the boot camp, if you will, that's got to be, it's tough. It's tough for people who are not acclimated to being, following orders and doing uh, not as they think they should do, but as somebody else says they should. And I can imagine women were no different than men. They, they took a, a, a lot of, of um, adaption to the military way of thinking. You know, it, it's your way, my way, and the military way. You know? That's correct. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. One of the, um, things that uh, people don't realize is the military was not ready for women. Even though the bill had been signed, the military was not ready for women. So my aunt, when she went to basic training in Fort Des Moines, Iowa, they had no barracks for them. They had leftover World War I cavalry barns. They swept out the barns, they set up cots, and that was their barracks and for many months until the barracks were finally built. But that's what they lived in. So they were actually sleeping in stalls exactly. for, for animals. Exactly. They were made for animals. Wow. You know, the, um, the hierarchy in the military had to adjust, I'm sure, to women. I mean, there's some very practical reasons why you have to change your buildings, you have to do certain things to accommodate women. But I can imagine that may have been a, a bit of pill for some to swallow in those days. Uh, yes, it, it was. Yeah. Um, as I said, they were also fighting sexual discrimination. But the women were all volunteers, which is a lot of people don't realize that. There was no conscription. There was no draft. They were all volunteers. They were very eager mm -hmm. to, to do their part and, and to help out and to fit in. It was all about patriotism in those days. Very much yeah, so. You were motivated to serve your country and that you knew that if you were taking a job uh, that a man would normally have, it puts that man out there in the battlefield to fight. Right. And that's exactly the, the spirit they had in those days. Yes, it, it was. And uh, does she have anything to say about, or any feelings about meeting new people from all over the country, I'm sure? Oh, she was full of stories. Yeah. And her scrapbook, which is five inches thick, uh -huh. um, has many, many pictures of yeah. the people that she worked with and, and that she met. Uh, she was stationed in England for three years, uh -huh. and she was a teletypist down underneath a mountain. Uh -huh. um, so if the mountain were bombed, the communication center would still be intact. So um, being over there three years, she, she did meet a lot of people. Yeah. Not a lot of women were sent overseas, were they? No, sir. M most of them weren't. Mm -hmm. Most of them weren't. But two years in, in England or three? Almost two and a half, two from and a half the beginning of 43 to a um, little bit after the war was over in mm -hmm. 45. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Now, we talked about various skills um, 
and the make do's that you had to do uh, uh, during the war. Now, I'm, I was a kid, uh, a child uh, during the Second World War, and I can remember I had uh, three aunts that were all teenagers or above, you know, dating. And I saw them do a strange thing one day. You know, little inquisitive children are they look and watch, and they were had what they called in those days leg makeup, and they were drawing a line up the back of their leg because lot nylon stockings were not able to be had anywhere. That's correct. Uh, the all, all the silk went to parachutes. Right. And nylon was not invented yet, I don't think, so ladies' stockings were made of silk, and silk went to parachutes, so the war effort was paramount. But speaking of silk, I think you have a little gem to show us that uh, during the war you have to make do. And I think you have an item there made of silk? I do. I do. Uh, of course, people were discharged on their points, on the point system. Mm -hmm. And when the war ended in Europe, and they were over there, my aunt wasn't shipped home actually until August. They didn't need the parachutes over there anymore. And my aunt was a seamstress. That was one of her favorite things to do. So they took the parachutes, and she taught them how to sew women's ladies' underwear out of, out of the leftover parachutes in their spare time because they were as I said, just waiting to go home. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what she did with that. Interesting. Now show it to the audience, to so, so the cameras, so they could, that's a, a brassiere or bra, that's I a guess they call it today. Mm -hmm. And she also taught them how to show, sew underwear, and so it kept them busy. It's fascinating. Thank, <laughs> thank you for that little show and tell. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so the book itself was a, a project, a four-year project, and it's taken you to, I'm sure, various places to tell your story. I know you do speaking tours as well, and you tell about the, the experiences uh, the women had in those days. And uh, you have some stories yourself, because you were, or you're a recent, or fairly recent, uh, veteran of the Navy, are you not? Well, not real recent. Right. I served from 1970 to 1977, ah, so Navy. Thank you for your service. Thank you. So to continue on, how did writing the book impact your life, aside from the obvious? I, I really, uh, it took me all over the country. Um, I, I never was in need for people to interview, for women to, I would interview a woman at a veteran's home and she'd say, well, here's my friend's number or here's my friend's address. Mm -hmm. And it ended up taking me all over the country to, to interview these different women. But um, the, the stories were just so amazing. I, I was really sad that I had to stop where I did, but. I had to get some place where I could print. Yes. It could have gone on for a long time. I'm sure, I'm sure. And th those are t uh, stories that very few people, except maybe people in their family, were aware of. You know? And women uh, left the military and went on to other careers they uh, did. based on what they learned in the military, which I find fascinating. And, and that's what's happening today, really. People are going to the military, men and women, and they're learning skills that they may not have had before, and they're, they're taking those skills with them into civilian life. Not that I'm, you know, pro-military necessarily, but I'm a veteran too, and I know okay. it, wor it worked for me. Yeah. <laughs> so now, uh, let's see what we have left. You have um, what jobs did you uh, did your aunt have in the in the um, army? Uh, you mentioned a few of them. Uh, some of them overseas. Yes. And uh, the camaraderie between the the, the women and the men uh, was that pretty much like it is today, or was it more of a uh, brother-sister type of thing? I believe it was closer. To hear my aunt talk, it, it was closer. There was a real need, a real common cause everybody was fighting mm -hmm. for. And um, I will say, though, that there were, because they did take a man's place, and mm -hmm. that did force men to go to the front and to the ships, there were still some um, uneasy feelings towards some of the women, yeah. even, even by the end of the war. But um, she, she made the best of it, and as she, you know, she came out and had nothing good to say but about her uh, fellow soldiers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now the, uh, nothing bad to say, you mean? No, I'm sorry, nothing bad okay. to say. Yeah, the, um, I presume a little resentment when a woman's doing a job and man is traditionally known to do. Right. Now, we don't talk much about the harm that women uh, experience in the military because you're in a war effort and you've got uh, your people, women stationed all over the world in some cases. 
but were women in harm's way than the military women? Yes, they were. Of course, the nurses were closer to the front and closer to the action than um, many of the other women. Um, there were, by the end of the war, over 200 nurses killed. Mm. Um, five were killed at Anzio, uh, 17 flight, uh, nurse flight attendants were killed during flying uh, on duty. Um, I believe six were killed when a kamikaze hit the USS, uh, it was one of the hospital ships, mm -hmm. and six nurses were killed there. 38 women of the WASP who flew the planes uh, for the Army were killed during, during their time. Uh, then the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is there were women POWs. Really? Yes. Uh, 11 uh, Navy, I believe, and um, oh, I think it was 40-some Army nurses were taken prisoner of war when the Japanese came in and took over the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And they were in internment for three years. My goodness. Yes. That had to be tough. Yeah. So it wasn't all just uh, clerical duty and uh, nice, neat, clean work. A lot of it was down and dirty, and, ha and you were dealing with a war, and the war is, uh, is hell, yes. as has been said. Yes. 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 Very interesting. Now, how many people have you interviewed for this book? I interviewed 52, plus my aunt's story, so the book contains 53 stories. Right, and they were all over the country. They were pretty much all over the country, right. yes. Well, we're very fortunate in that we have one of those people right with us today. So uh, I'd like to take a short break and come back and introduce the, the lady to the audience. That's great. Peg Trout is the author of the book, Sisters in War. And joining us is a lady by the name of Joan de Munbrum Schwachgard. 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 And Joan is a member of the uh, Veterans of the Women's Army Corps from 1942 to 1945. Joan, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So, you're an Army veteran, one of the first, and someone told me you just recently had a birthday. Yes, a hundred and one. A hundred and one. My goodness. That is remarkable. That is absolutely remarkable. Well, tell us a little bit about your, your history with the military. You were one of the, as I said, one of the first women to join the WACS or the Women Arm, Arm, Army Corps back in 1942, was it? 42. The, 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 when the uh, uh, military started on December 7th, my, I was a hairdresser, and my, beauty, uh, my patrons were all losing their boyfriends and sweethearts. And I just couldn't take it, so I closed the door and signed up for myself <laughs> for three years. And you were one of the first. One of the very first. Uh, and where did you where did you go initially? First, first off, where were you sent? Well, we uh, we were they sent they put basic training out in Des Moines so that they would be away from the media. They didn't want the to be known that there were women in the service. Is that right? Because every man was replaced by a woman. Uh -huh. So they didn't want that. So we were all secret. We were never to write home or anything. I'm and so uh, that was in 42. And I, I, I joined and, and, and went to a basic training in Des Moines and went to the Texas border, Eagle Pass Army Air Base. And I was there almost three years. Wow. And you were originally from where? From Minnesota. From Minnesota. So now, you, and you've been pretty independent all your life. Well, my mother passed away when I was 10 years old, uh, so I've been on my own most of my life. Well, that accounts for the fact that you look so well at 101 years old. It's, it's, you're, remo you're a remarkable woman, believe me. So t tell us now, Joan, what motivated you to go into the military? I, I'm sure it was patriotism. It's part well, of it. My, I was being a hairdresser. I, my my customers were losing their boyfriends and husbands and so forth, and I just couldn't take it. So I just closed the doors, never sold anything, just closed the doors and went in myself for three years away from home and three years in, in the military. Wonderful. I was a photographer. That was about to ask you that. You were a photographer. And uh, tell us a little, little bit about what that entailed. 
What kind of a job was it? Well, the photographer, we took the pictures as they came on the field, and then if there was a tragedy and, and a casualty, I'd have to take a copy of the picture and send it to their family. Okay, so and you, that was the most s s saddest thing I had to do. I'm sure of that. So you took a picture of the, the men. As they came all, on all the, the field. All the boys who were becoming pilots. That's and you right. take a picture of them when they first got there, and then if there was a tragedy and a, and a, and a death in a, in a, a plane crash, you had to take pictures of that for for the military. Yes. And then send the picture to of the Washington. Right. And then, then we would, uh, I, then I'd get a copy of that picture of them that I had taken and send it to their family. Yeah. And that was the saddest part. I'm of my sure job. that was yes. And uh, how many years did you do that? Well, I did that f for for 18 months, and then 18 months I was teaching the operation and maintenance of aerial cameras. And I find that very interesting because part of that job was to rehabilitate men who had been injured uh, or had, uh, I guess what they call uh, fatigue, battle fatigue, and br to bring them back to a useful life. So you taught camera repair, did you? Yes, the operation maintenance of aerial cameras. Mm -hmm. And, and to also, if the, when the men went out with the aerial camera in the field, if something happened to it, they could help fix mm -hmm. it a little bit. But mo many of the men have, were coming from Japan, and they were telling us our, their stories, mm -hmm. and that was most interesting. I'm sure some of them were maybe prisoners of war in Japan? They were all pri those from Japan were all prisoners of war. And we allowed uh, so much each week so that they could tell their stories. And it was most interesting. I'm sure it was. It was probably very, very good for the men also to be able to tell those stories and uh, to have a, a woman there to listen. I'm, I'm sure it was and, and comforting. I was, as, a, as, a, as a woman, I was a teacher. And they call, instead of calling me sergeant, they called me Miss Sergeant. <laughs> and you were a sergeant, were you that? Now, uh, you mentioned something uh, in the previous interview. Uh, uh, we may have covered it here, maybe not. Uh, when you first went in the military, being a woman, you had you know you wanted to be uh, maintain your feminine uh, attire. Yes, when when we first went in, I I put on my best clothes. I had a red feather hat and my best dress, and we got there, and. I said to the girls, now we're going to stay feminine, aren't we? Because the, the girls were driving the trucks and they looked very masculine. So I said, we're going to stay feminine, aren't we? Well, they didn't have, two, two hours later, we were in men's uniforms because they didn't have women's uniforms for us yet for our coats. So th there were men's uniforms, all size 42 coats <laughs> that we were in. <laughs> and if you wanted to keep warm, you had to wear the coats. <laughs> you had to wear the coats. And there were 500 of us landed at one time in, in this barracks in Des Moines, Iowa. It used to be a barn. It was, had been a barn. And, and so they, we had upper and lower bunks. So and there was 500 of us landed there on one day. So you slept where the animals had slept before. <laughs> that had to be pretty tough. That had to be tough. So uh, you spent four years in the military? Three years. Three years. And, and never out of uniform and never home. Yeah. So now when you l left the military, you had another career, did you not? Yes, I, I took the advantage of the GI Bill for the two years of Army training, a military tra uh, photographic training, and then I went as a staff photographer for a university in New Mexico. And then one interesting thing that I did there, you remember the Teddy Roosevelt Rough Riders? Of course, uh, yeah. Well, their, their 50th convention came up while I was there in, in Las Vegas. And I, photog I, I photographed them for the Denver Post. Ah, so you photographed his history. <laughs> history. They were 50 years, had been 50 years already. Wow. And I photographed their history for the 50 years for the Denver Post. That was great. So you continued your career as a photographer? P partly. 
and then, then uh, as a photographer, you couldn't make money. So I went to work and, and had to work with a, um, with uh, uh, just just an ordinary job, and it was 25 years with a with a a, a, a milit uh, the, the Ralph M. Parsons Company, 25 years as accounts payable oh. for a foreign foreign company. Uh -huh. So I learned a lot about the Far East. Yes, I bet. So you you're a very remarkable woman because you you never let the grass grow under your feet, as they say. <laughs> you just keep on doing things. <laughs> Yeah. Now well, tell us a little bit about the American Legion. You're very involved with the American Legion, are you well, not? I joined, the, I'm very, um, that's Protestant, the American Legion, you know, that started the Bill of Rights. Uh -huh. And I, I've been a legionnaire since 1947, when wow. 400 of us stood on, the, on a platform and gave our Pledge of Allegiance. So I've been a Legionnaire since 1947. Wow. Good for you. And an American Legion is vets helping vets. Absolutely. So I'm the right part. Good for you. Good for you. Now Peg tells us you were the first woman she interviewed for her book. So you started the whole thing. You started this whole thing with the book, and it's it's, re it, it's reached everyone everywhere. It has. it has. Tell us a little bit about that experience, Peg, with. Uh, yeah. When I first started the project, uh, I called down to the veterans' home in Chula Vista, and the public relations uh, man there put me in touch with Joan because she had been a photographer. He knew that I was into the photography end of it, and she set up uh, not only her interview, but she set up the rest of the interviews for me with the World War II veterans down there, the women, and I'm very thankful to her for that. Very thankful. Yeah, a remarkable woman in so many ways. There, there's an example. Well, we're running short of time. I, I can't thank you enough for spending your time with us. I, 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 could, I could spend two hours talking to you, Joan, <laughs> without a problem. <laughs> and the fact that you've contributed so much to Peg's work, and Peg has contributed so much to just telling the story of women in the military. That's right. I want to thank you both for being here spending your time with us. Thank you very much for being with Pace Television, and I wish you the, all the luck in the world, Joan and Peg both. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and thank you. You're quite welcome. And, uh, thank you.